There are a lot of bad video games out there. Many times the blame can be put on the company or development team responsible since they have a track record of poor software. Companies like Acclaim and US Gold put out some truly rubbish material in their time, and even some of the best companies like Sunsoft started to resort to quantity over quality later in their history. Usually when you think of Sega though, you have visions of game after game of near perfect quality. Whether it was the early days on the master system of games like Shinobi, epic sports titles like Joe Montana Football 94 on the Genesis, killer strategy RPGs like Shining Force 3 on the Saturn, or dead on accurate arcade ports like House of the Dead 2 on the Dreamcast, Sega always seemed to deliver. And while our rose tinted glasses have a way of convincing us that's how it really was, the truth is that Sega put out some embarrassing software themselves. Whether it was developed by, published, or both, the games you are about to see all had Sega involved in some form, and I really took exception to that. As a Sega fan, I am one to applaud quality when it's deserved, but I am not one to simply give a game a pass because Sega's name was on the box. In this episode, we will be taking a look at 10 games that Sega should be ashamed of. Whether it was the sound, the graphics, the gameplay, or all of the above, these games failed to live up to Sega's usual rock-solid reputation. I hope you guys enjoy Games That Sega Should Be Ashamed Of, Part 2. In 1987, Enduro Racer was released on the Master System. Instead of porting the sprite-scaling arcade classic, Sega actually remade the game entirely from an overhead isometric perspective. It wasn't a particularly good game, but it also wasn't bad enough to make a list like this just on its quality alone. What earned it a place here is the fact that the game was twice as large in Japan. You heard that right. In Sega's infinite wisdom, they took the 2 megabit Japanese cart, cut it back to 1 megabit for the US, Europe, and Brazil, and released it with half the tracks and a few other bits missing. Thing is, in the US, the game was still released at full retail price, despite the missing content. A few other games would fall to this despicable practice as well, and it's something that really surprised me. It's one thing to make business decisions that can save the company money. It's something else entirely to shave content in an already short software release to accomplish it. Being a 49ers fan and avid lover of the NFL, you can imagine my excitement to play Joe Montana football for the Sega Genesis. It had been hyped up in magazine ads and commercials for months, and I just knew Sega was going to put out something really special. I was disappointed that it didn't have the league or player's license behind it, but that wasn't a given back in those days. What did suck, however, was the phoned-in graphics and gameplay. As the story goes, Sega of America had signed Joe Montana to a then-massive five-year deal worth millions of dollars. At the time, they lacked an internal studio capable of making a football game, so they got MediaGenic, which was essentially just Activision, to do it for them. At the time, Activision was in complete corporate chaos, however, and after months of development, they still didn't have anywhere near a finished product. Sega, in complete desperation mode, approaches Electronic Arts to rebrand their Madden game as Joe Montana Football. EA refused, but agreed to help Sega get their game out. In a shrewd and aggressive play, Park Place Productions took their Madden engine and deliberately downgraded it and sold it to Sega as the game we all received. That's right, Sega fans. The first Joe Montana football for the Genesis is just a deliberately gimped version of John Madden football. Sega had a really great run with the Disney license on the Genesis. We got killer classics like Castle of Illusion and Quackshot early on, setting the stage for many more to follow. Not all was great in the Magical Kingdom, however. 
In 1992, Sega published the Blue Sky Software developed Ariel the Little Mermaid. Now the thing is, is that Blue Sky Software had been responsible for Jurassic Park and Vector Man, so in hindsight you may think this was a good thing. Not so fast, because they really dropped the ball with this glorified maze game. While you can play as either Ariel or her father, the underwater gameplay is just awful. It's slow and choppy, and I mean to the point where you feel like the entire game engine is broken and under the threat of complete shutdown the entire time. The stage design keeps you looping around massive areas that all look the same, and the powers at your disposal are inaccurate and absolutely no fun to use. When Sega kept the Disney projects internal, they were great, but the quality tended to go straight to hell when someone else got a hold of them. One of the worst games Sega ever had their name associated with on the Genesis. When my daughter started showing interest in video games, I was one proud papa. I wanted to nurture this interest into a full-blown appreciation for the hobby. I started looking at games I thought she'd enjoy. That led me to the Sega-published Genesis Abomination, known as Barney's Hide and Seek Game. It had been developed by Real Time Associates in 1993, the company responsible for the bug games on the Sega Saturn. I figured it had to be playable, right? Nope. What I was met with was pure visual, audio, and gameplay torture of the worst kind. The gems driven music and sound effects will terrorize your ears, while the bubblegum visuals are the stuff of nightmares. The gameplay is as the title implies, you go around the stage looking for hidden kids and presents, but it's constantly interrupted by Barney pointing out what you should and shouldn't do. The problem with that is, is that the challenge is utterly destroyed because he points out the stuff you need to do and find as well. Even for a kid's game, this is just a trifling mess of software masquerading as a video game. It's also heavily focused on digitized speech, but it ain't good speech and you get tired of hearing it after only a few minutes. My daughter quickly lost interest and told me to put Sonic back in. This was one fine lesson for me as a father. Just because you have a little girl, don't assume she'll enjoy the stuff you think little girls should. It's better to let her figure that out all on her own. Let's go up! I see a friend! Remember, I love you! Being a Sega Genesis owner back in the day, it became pretty clear that it wasn't going to do Sega's arcade sprite scaling games a lot of justice visually. Without any dedicated hardware to assist in the feature, it was always going to be choppier and less detailed. Of course, that didn't mean the port necessarily had to be terrible either. There are a few games on the Genesis that were actually quite solid using software-based tricks. When I saw Galaxy Force 2 running though, I just couldn't believe it. Developed by CRI, this was the laziest excuse of a 16-bit title I've ever seen. I mean, the Genesis had no chance replicating the arcade, but they could have at least tried. Instead, CRI just said to hell with it and jettisoned three quarters of the graphical assets. What's left is a game that puts you more in mind of an Atari 2600 game instead of a powerful 16-bit Genesis title. It's also riddled with sprite flicker, something you should rarely see in a Genesis game. This gave me an entirely new appreciation for stuff like Space Harrier 2. While I disliked that game as well, the developers at least tried to give you something that looked like the arcade original. If this was the very best they could do with Galaxy Force 2, however, they should have left it on the cutting room floor. Super Scalers often had a hard time on the old Genesis, but this one ranks among the worst. When I ordered my Japanese Dreamcast at launch, the only way you could get it was through an import store. And boy did they love to price gouge you as an early adopter. My package came with the system, a VMU, Virtua Fighter 3, Pin Pin Triceland, and Godzilla Generations. 
Now I have no shame in telling you the only one I cared about was Virtua Fighter 3 in that package, but I was really hoping the Godzilla game would surprise me and be worth owning. It was developed by General Entertainment, who also happened to be the ones behind Pin Pin Triacelon. I was a fan of Godzilla as a kid, so the prospect of crushing cities on my brand new next generation Sega machine held a bunch of appeal. No such luck, however. This game is as lame and as boring as you can imagine. The visuals are substandard for a PlayStation game, much less one that's supposed to be debuting a new standard. Godzilla is low polygon with glaring joints and odd angles. Nothing you crush or break has any satisfaction to it. It's like you're a monster in a big rubber suit and it's cardboard cutouts you're knocking over. The tank style gameplay is slow, imprecise, and feels like it sometimes does what it wants on its own. Sega was so ashamed of it themselves, they didn't release it outside of Japan. A sequel was released a bit later called Maximum Impact, but it wasn't much better. This was no way to launch new hardware in a country where your previous system had been so popular. As a fan of Decathlete and Winter Heat on the Saturn, I had been very much looking forward to the Dreamcast game Virtua Athlete 2000. It promised four-player competitive action, better graphics, and you could even customize your athlete. Someone forgot to give the developers at Hitmaker the blueprint for success, because they missed the mark by a wide margin here. First, there's only seven events in the entire game. How could we go from ten to seven when this was supposed to be bigger and better? Then they had to go messing with the gameplay. I mean, Decathlete and Winter Heat had been about as perfect as they needed to be, but no, Hitmaker had to change it up for the worst. The running events have a stamina meter that really makes things infuriating on the harder settings. Mash those buttons too quickly, and you lose stamina to the point where you can't run in a normal stride. It's an unnecessary addition that goes way beyond how it was used in Decathlete. The timing of the skill-based events are also worse. The meter that governs power and the angle of your throws needs to be exact or you fail every damn time. There's also the sound and music which both need to be muted or you'll want to turn this off before you ever see any of the gameplay. The athlete graphics are also piss poor and nowhere near the heights of other sports games like Virtua Tennis. Sega needed something for the 2000 Olympics and they kicked this out the door with no care at all about its quality. Even though I am a Sega fan, sometimes I play something I immediately know I'm not going to like very much. When I first played Sonic Spinball, I knew 20 seconds in, that game wasn't for me. When I got my hands on Tails Sky Patrol for the Game Gear, I didn't need half that time to know this was a game I should have turned off and never touched again. Starring Sonic's best bud and sidekick Tails, you use your two asses to fly through five stages of pure unadulterated hell. This is one of the most frustrating one-hit wonders I've ever played. Touch anything, you're dead. Again and again. I have never died so many times in a video game in my life, and playing it here again, I was quickly reminded just how atrocious it plays. It's absolutely unforgiving, and just how small kids were supposed to enjoy this is beyond me. I mean, you can die and have to continue on the training stage for God's sakes. No doubt the developers at Sims knew they had a really short game, so they overcompensated by making it painfully difficult. Sega must have known it had a dud on its hands because they only released it in Japan. The release of the Sega CD was one of the most exciting times in gaming for me. I had all sorts of visions of sprite scaling powerhouse releases, so when Joe Montana NFL Football was announced for it, I was ready day freaking one to own it. 
It was to use scaling and rotation of the machine for a pseudo 3D engine that would put Madden and other 16-bit games to shame. It was handled by Malibu Interactive that did Batman Returns for the Sega CD, so I knew they had the talent to take advantage of the hardware. As it turns out, it's shame on me for believing Sega of America had any quality control over the project to make sure it was a winner. What we ended up with was a choppy, ugly mess of a game that played as bad as it looked. I mean, soak up what you were looking at there. It's the kind of visuals that you can just look at and know it plays badly. The entire thing is a pixelated mess. The running game is broken, the passing game is a Hail Mary every time, and I swear the players run different routes than what you choose. It even lacks basic indicators for things like interceptions. Sometimes it just happens and you have no clue what just transpired. Sega was trying to sell customers on a $300 upgrade for their Sega Genesis and yet this was orders of magnitude inferior to what they could already play on their base console. Sega had a reputation as a sports leader at the time and this really hurt their standing in the North American market after the awful reviews came in. Add in the fact that other Sega Sports franchises were completely MIA on the device and you really had to wonder just what the hell Sega was doing. With the 32X coming together quickly and being dropped in the North American market in November of 1994, Sega was desperate to get software out for it. They got a handful of projects in line and kicked them out the door, lickety split. Among that batch was the unforgettable Cosmic Carnage, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game developed by Almanac, the same company that did Mazing Saga. You'd get no such quality here, however. Whether it was due to the shortened development cycle or the size and skill of the team, this was not a good game. You have a choice of eight fighters with different armor configurations that changes up your special moves. This could have been something cool if the gameplay wasn't so poor. There's little in the way of a coherent combo system here and the constant slowdown destroys the flow of the action. The zooming on the sprite and backgrounds is listed as a feature, but it ain't smooth, nor is the gameplay even when it's running at full speed. To make matters worse, there are horrible imbalances between the fighters, making the two-player mode virtually useless once you find the overpowered moves. But where Sega should really be ashamed is the fact they slapped a $70 price tag on this in the States. It was known as Cyber Brawl in Japan, where it was even more expensive if you can believe it. The only saving grace with this ripoff were the fatalities, and it had some decent music. Being a dedicated fan of a gaming company has its ups and downs. While Sega would really impress me with many of their games, it also left me wide open to buying software that was not equally as good. These 10 games really left me feeling disappointed or just plain ripped off. I think this was one of the reasons Sega had such a hard time in the different markets of the world. Often the stuff Sega would outsource to other developers and then publish was nowhere near the same quality of the stuff Sega developed internally. This kind of created a trail of broken promises with some of their games. You could have been blown away by Castle of Illusion but then walked face first into Fantasia. You could have loved those Sega arcade games only to buy some half-assed home port that was nothing of the sort. I think it speaks volumes about how important quality control was to your brand name. It only takes one bad game to send a customer to your competitor. For all the talk about Sega's hardware being too soon, too hard to program for, or too unnecessary, I think their biggest issue was keeping their IPs, franchises, and publishing arm under stricter control. Every game should have been babied, grown and evolved with each and every entry, and ultimately made sure it deserved the Sega name on the box. Had that been the case, I think maybe they would still be around with a Sega Super Genesis Mark VI today, instead of making games for the companies they once competed against. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, 
and I will catch you next time.